one of the um, one of the reasons, mate. Well, well we we're gonna we planned this anyway, didn't we? Before this, to kind of have a chat again. But I know people have really enjoyed uh, listening to the last one. I've had so many personal messages just about your story because you know working class lad who's you know got this dream, this vision, and this productivity and, and what you've created. And I know and I know it's inspired a lot of people. It's inspired me and Tom. But one of the big things, mate. And sorry to embarrass you, kind of blow smoke up your ass a bit, but. One of the things I always think of now with times like this and times of crisis, you know, this is where the leaders and this is where the bosses and people who get paid the big bucks, this is where they now have to prove there is a reason why they leave and why they get paid the big bucks. And I think, you know, the onus is on our leaders now, the leaders of the country. And just from you, mate, you know, with, with Sadulo, you know, you're the kind of, it, it, it's your baby, it's your running the ship. One thing that I was so impressed with before this kicked off is your man management and how you lead. But on a personal note, um, obviously me and you had an agreement uh, that I'd be taking on um, a role within Sedulo. And when all this happened, I said to you, look, mate, I completely understand this. I want to just hold fire and we pick it up again. And your credit, you turned around and said, look, Andy, we made the agreement. I said, we'd do it, we'll do it. And for me, it was a... I can't tell you how much that meant to me, mate. Not only did it help me personally, but to see you, not only I've seen you lead by example in your workspace, but then also to be a man of your word and say, look, I said we'd do this, we're going to do it. For me now to be kind of in a small way part of the Sudulo team and to see that leadership, I, I just think, mate, that is just so, it's massive, it's, it's inspiring, it's comforting. It's, and I think in a time where I think we all need a bit of, bit of inspiring, we all need to feel that warm, fuzzy feeling it was massive, mate, and I think, you know, massive credit to you and a massive chuckle to you for, for doing for doing that for me and, and also what you're doing for your company. And I just think now is the time where where people need to step step up and, and be those good bosses and be those good leaders. And um, so first off, massive thank you. But secondly, on the back of that, it, it, you know, are you in agreement where this is the time now that you want to see yourself kind of the leaders of the country and businesses, big businesses kind of stepping up and, and taking a similar lead? You know what, I'll, I will say that about leaders. I mean, I take it very seriously. Do you know what I mean? I, I, actually, I actually understand that I've got a workforce, I guess, that, that are looking up to me. You know, if I start panicking, if I start moving away from my principles um, because of where I am or where we are, um, I, I just, I would feel a fraud. You know, I would feel like I'm some time-ish. I would feel like, really, and let me just turn this off so we don't get any more of them noises. I would just feel like I'm not the, I'm not being true to myself. And I think what what we all need to do right now, leaders, but everybody, I think we've all got to show the best version of ourselves. And we've got to challenge ourselves to do that. Because it's not easy every day if you lead a team to be the one that's happy, smiley, and, and it's, you know, every day. It's fucking hard, particularly when it's harder, but it's needed more so. So I think um, as an individual, just as a, no, a person in society, I think we're all going to show um, <clears throat> our true colours. Because in adversity, it turns you one way or the other. You either come through that, and you, you know this more than anyone, but you either come through it and find inner strength, in a things that that actually move you on leaps and bounds or you go the opposite way and you become a miserly fucker and you become moody and whingy and you you fucking look after your own and 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 i just i, I detest that kind of person if i be truthful about you so uh, if i be truthfully honest so for me it's like first of all how do i show the best version of myself how do i challenge myself now um just on a personal level to, to, to be a better person when I come out of this. And then there's a responsibility I've got as, I guess, a leader of not just my organisation, but all the other boards that I'm on of other organisations or the 2,000 clients that we've got that are ringing me right now panicking. It's not just my workforce of 100 and odd staff. You know, I've got clients ringing me every day that want comfort. They want, they want, that, um, they want that strength. They want a shoulder to lean on. And... Um, I feel like I can be one of those people. I don't know whether I'm doing it, you, uh, whether I'm good at it or not, but I'm giving it my best shot. So I think that, you know, we've never needed leaders as much as you do when you're in a position like this in adversity. And I'm taking it, I take it very, very um, seriously and I take that responsibility. And I purposely do things because of that. 
So, um, yeah, so the idea of me like taking, I had a, a member of staff rang me yesterday who heads up a department and he said, I'd like to offer a 25% salary reduction. We, you know, we, we, uh, part of what we do is helping within uh, financial matters in court. And he said, court's closing, mate. You know, my team are going to build nothing. And I said, listen, that's fine. Train your staff, develop your staff, do everything that you possibly can to be as business as usual as you can. And don't worry about what, our, what your billing's going to be, what your targets that need to be met are going to be. And don't worry about your salary. You know, now's a time for, for people to recognize um, what, what, what if, you're a, if you're a boss of a business then, it's a time to recognize what people have done over years, not over four weeks or eight weeks. Mm. And I have a bit of an issue if I be truthful. I've got to be careful what I say here now because I have got a lot of clients. I have a bit <laughs> of, and, I've, and I've, had, I've had a few tough words with, with clients when they were knee jerking around about laying people off and all this kind of stuff well before there was kind of one either a lockdown or two understanding what the government was going to do to help us. And I had a few tough conversations with people a bit like, you know, you come across as a, as a leader of men, a leader of people. And, and yet now's the time to stand up and be counted and not start knee jerking and cutting costs and making redundancies and doing all these kind of things. So I think we'll be judged by who we are in adversity. You, you know, you never you shouldn't judge anyone by how they behave in the good times. Mm. Paul, yeah. I wanted to ask you, you've uh, obviously built, a, you know, like you said, 2000 clients now. Do you feel um, more under pressure now, given what's, and this is just what's going on versus like when you had four or five people, because you've got obviously more people on the payroll and. Um, good question, mate. I think it's always the higher, the, I guess the higher you are, the, 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 the larger the fall, isn't it? Mm. So I think from like an anxiety, uh, ego, ego anxiety, I'm not sure whether it's which one of them it is, but I think I remember saying on my podcast when I had Peter Cowgill, who's the chairman of JD Sports, and he talked about, I think they were, were valued at 5 billion that day, and he talked about how anxious he was every day to make sure it was 5.1 billion and then 5.2 billion. And, um, and, and so, you know, there was a time probably where they turned over 20 million where success would have been 50 million. It just, you move the barometers. Mm. And then I think you get used to that level of, I don't know whether it's the, the, the notoriety even that's feeding your ego. Let's mm. just be honest about it all. Um, there's, there's always a driver. And I think in many cases, it's vulnerability, insecurity, ego. It's usually a negative that drives people forward, I've found. So I think for me, if, if it would have been four members of staff and my business um, didn't succeed because of this, I'd dust myself off a lot quicker than if everybody knew Sajulo had gone to rat shit and, and I know a lot more people who know of my brand and, and our business. And we're quite vocal as well. It's not like, we, it's not like we're quiet. So... <laughs> So, you know, our head is well above the parapet. In, and when your head's above the parapet, you get shot down, right, isn't it? So mm -hmm. by some people. So so I feel more pressure from that perspective, Tom, yeah. Mm. No, you, you just certainly strike me as someone who, who does really well under pressure and can keep yeah. that, that face still smiling, you know. Yeah, I've had a lot of people, because people know that I suffer with, uh, with anxiety, and uh, I've had a lot of people reach out to me, which is nice, saying, how are you? The reality is, is, I think right in that, right now I'm in my element. It's just the way it is. I'm like, I feel like, fuck me, this is a challenge. And I've got to fucking look after 2,000 clients, 100 and odd staff. I don't want this, you know, my family, my family's family, the community, which I'll come back to in a bit. Because I think, you know, we're doing as much in the community, if not more now than they ever had. Whereas other people are shrinking to look after themselves and, we did that for a week or two to make sure we were solid. And then we went back out into our communities to help them. Um, so I've used that as a, in a way, my mind is busy focusing on real problems. I tend, and so I'm in my element. It tends to be worse for me, probably on the way out of this. When, when, when things are starting to become more calmer and more smooth is when my mind starts to play games with me and play tricks with myself. So you know, I will be, um, I will have to really monitor that on the way out of this rather than in the middle of the battle. They always say this, you know, 
you, if you if you if you sat in a pub and somebody comes running at you, you don't start thinking I'm anxious, I'm stressed, I'm a bit depressed. You know that all <laughs> that comes and you just deal with it what you need to deal with, and um, it's a situation like that in it for whatever yeah. the society, for economy, the community. You're so right though, mate, in the sense of um, it's so easy, isn't it, to stay positive and to stay smiley when everything's going well. You know, the real test of character is how are you going to react when shit hits the fan? It's, it's so true, and I think that's where people now are going to really see that. 100%. But it does allow you to test yourself. It does allow yeah. you to bring the best out of yourself. It allows you to bring the best out of other people. And it shows you, no matter whether it's work or in relationships or your mates or... It really does show you what people's characters are made of. Um, I'm somebody that constantly tries to self-improve. Um, you know, whether or not I do or not is different matter, but I try to self-improve, and I see this appear at a time where other people, you, you see in life, other people just drift, so they won't be, those mm. self-improvers won't be challenging themselves right now. Uh, yeah. People who do, people who, ha- who, who are, um, I think they can be part of the solution. So, you know, I don't, not, not in any grand thing. I'm not saying I can do anything ridiculously phenomenal, but within my community that I live in, whether it be my family, my house, my work, the local communities that, that we have offices in, we can be at least part of the solution. Mm. I, th- I think it's so important what you said before, though, mate, about the, um, you know, you're doing your best to be a good leader, both the team that you've created now, you know, you've got people coming to you saying, look, you know, I'll take a wage reduction. It's it's so important, isn't it, that you're not just the only one who's having to kind of bring a smile to the table. You know, you need to rely on everyone to kind of bring that same attitude, that same enthusiasm to want to fight and get through this challenge. You can't just be one person because then the re- everyone else will bring everyone else down. It's, it's that kind of you need to inspire that throughout the team. So it's then self-fulfilling, isn't it? 100%. And, and, you, and I believe in this, like carrying it forward, and I believe it's even more, um, even more important now. Um, so, so don't get me wrong. When you made the offer of look, you know, um, you, I don't know whether to send my invoice this month, Paul. Blah blah blah. I'm like, if you was a dickhead, <laughs> I would have. Yeah, Andy, I think we need to uh, uh, see where we go to the to the coronavirus. But I'll be honest with you, because I know the person you are, it'd be kind of like over my i would feel like i'd really let down our relationship for the for the long term if i did that because i know the kind of person um you are do you know what i mean so mm. i think that kind of carrying it forward paying forward i think it's very 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 important right now i, I put an email a, a tweet out and a linkedin out every friday saying have you paid your suppliers today because it's you know we pay our we it hurts more every week that we're in this, but we pay everybody every week like we ordinarily would because we have to keep that um, that flow, that positivity, and the blood moving around the system, you know. It is our yeah. lifeblood at the end of the day. We have to move it around. I've seen some people putting up on LinkedIn, don't pay anything but your wages and your staff. And at first I thought, am I doing the wrong thing here? Trying to keep, I'm a too positive. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm trying to keep the world wheel that in eight weeks, 12 weeks, when every, everybody else has pulled back, you know, I'm going to have burnt all my cash. So I was contemplating all night, like, was, are you doing the right thing here, Paul, keeping the blood moving around? And I thought, what a stupid thing it was for the guy who would consider himself a leader, by the way, in business, to say, don't pay your taxes, don't pay your uh, uh, suppliers. The only thing you pay now is your uh, is your staff and no one else. And I thought, well, if somebody did that to me, that means I would never get any money in. I would never get paid. So what I believe in is I expect people to pay me, but then I've got to do my bit and I've got to withhold my principal, mm. if you like, and pay them. Um, so that's how we that's how we're doing it. So we're keeping the wheels turning. Mate, in, term, in terms of keeping the wheels turning, what are your thoughts about people like trying to find new business during this time? Um, me and Andy had a conversation before about, you know, whether it's, you know, in inverted brackets, a cunty move to start trying to sell, you know, if Andy had some sort of, I don't know, motivational course or something to start selling that, that sort of thing. What are your thoughts around that during this time? Because obviously people need cash, don't they? But then they don't want to come across like they're trying to take somewhat advantage of the situation. Yeah. I think it's just before that, Paul, I think it's, it's why when we said that, because it's, 
I think you see so much goodwill going on, don't you, at the moment? It's like you've just got that, that pension he's just raised seven, seventeen million, is it or something? And now you'd always yeah. think and then someone else pops up and they say, Oh, I'll do something, but you know, you want to pay for it. I think new business ideas that are popping up, it's when when it's in contrast to someone raising money for charity, it's like, Well, why don't you do that business? But well, do it's such a it's such a hard one at the moment, isn't it? Big time. We just had a meeting on it this morning because we're working probably twice as as uh, as much at the moment. I mean, so as a business, we're doing about similar to what we always did, but we're probably having to do twice, two to three times as much work for it because our clients just need us a lot more at the moment. And um, we we uh, and on Monday the portal goes live for people to reclaim uh, their furloughed employee stuff. So if you employ uh, if you employ people, you're obviously allowed to get a grant for certain employees if you furloughed them. And that portal goes up on Monday. So the last week and a month, we ordinarily do, say, four or 500 payrolls, you know, for people's businesses. Um, but this month, we've got to do the payroll. And then if they furloughed any staff, we've then got to do a calculation on what their grant should be. And then we've got to go on to an online portal that goes live on Monday. And... Um, and we've got to wait in a queue with our 500 clients to get through to, but we don't know how it's going to work yet. And I was like, can't fucking charge for this. <laughs> and the guys were like, no, we need to, because they've all got targets hit, right? So I'm like, we can't fucking charge for this. And they're going, no, Paul, have you seen how much work's involved in this? And I'm like, yeah, but we're getting the money back in the, like, in the, in the, in the uh, coronavirus. And they're like, yeah, but Paul, we, we're usually chaotic for a week at payroll, month end. Now we're going to be chaotic, and we're going to have to work through the night. So I'm actually going to move to a 24-hour uh, processing and have people at home working through the night, hoping that the portal has got obviously less traffic to it through the evening, like 2, Jeez. 3, 4 o'clock in the wow. morning. And I'm like, okay, fuck it. So we came up with, and this is what we have come up with, we're going to charge 10 quid. For every employee where well, they get, and they're going to get roughly, probably on average, we think £2,000, £2,500 per employee back that they furloughed, okay? So if the average one's got 10, they're going to get 25 grand back and we're going to charge them 100 quid. But it really took me like a long time to get comfortable yeah. with the fact we should do that because of all the mm. goodwill um, that you're seeing. And we put it out last night to our client base like we'll do all your grants for you but we can't do it for free we're gonna to have to try and cover some costs because this is a business as well and mm. uh, we had two complaints um, last night out of like 400 emails this morning i was like devastated we'd had two complaints you know what i mean <laughs> it's just the way it is um yeah. because like you say there is so much goodwill um mm. go, um going around but and i guess that's why i'm trying to do as much goodwill with our with our suppliers or with our partners or with, you know, the community, we're still right. We're writing checks every week uh, into the community at the moment. Oh, mate, not even, not even the thing that you've done there, mate. You know what was one of the best things for me? And, and I've seen when this first started, um, I had about 20 grand's worth of work booked in this year uh, over the next few months, just gone completely. And then I started hearing rumours about, oh, you can get this back and that back. And I was watching Sky News and didn't really understand a lot of it enough. And then I looked on LinkedIn, and then there you are in front of a you know blackboard show, oh, whatever yeah, you want to yeah, call yeah, it, so that, whiteboard. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I've learned more in this two three minute video about my finances and about the economy and about what's going to happen than I have watching Sky News for half an hour. And I think I think I actually shared one of the posts and said, you know, anyone who's like me, you know, follow it. And fuck me, mate, that for me was I thought that was unbelievable. It's a, it's a funny one, isn't it? And the, you know what I think? And I put a, uh, a, a comment out last night and, and on, on the leadership of the delivery of the speech yesterday. Um, and without getting too political about it, I thought it, was, I thought it was really poor. And some other people have thought it was okay. But I look at people like Jurgen Klopp, right? I look at leaders. And when he speaks, you hang on every word he says. Mm. He doesn't try to bullshit you. He talks from the heart but it's intelligent talk from the heart. And um, when I'm doing those clips, what I'm trying to do is, is kind of hand back power and knowledge to people. Because I think what happens all too often is 
people talk robotic and they talk in such legislative terminology. Nobody understands what the fuck anybody's saying. Mm-hmm. So they do, no. they do something for half an hour. And I'm sat there like, I need to re- go through this again and go through this again. Yeah. And of course, I've got then a team of experts that I can ring in, in my own team, like the tax guy, the, whatever, uh, um, and say, is this what they meant by that? Is this what they meant by that? Because mm. I'm being like this, like this, this poshness, right, yeah. where you have to talk really eloquently to be really fucking clever. And I don't believe that. <laughs> That's so true. You know, so you know what I mean? And so I yeah. think what we need now is if you look at the leaders you admire, I mean, what leaders do you admire? And you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you will come back to people who you can relate to probably. You can that's what to. I mean, mate. You're, you're, you were saying things and it's so great. Like, you know, you were going, you said it as it was, but then you said, in my opinion, I think this would be good and this would be bad and this is good. And it was like, thankfully, you're just being honest and open and transparent. And I can just... You know, rather than oh, saying yeah. all these, you, you're both saying the same thing, but yeah. you're telling me it in a way that it's I can digest. And I think you're so right. I don't know who they're trying to impress with the way they're speaking and the way that, you know, the, they come up with these sentences and structured sentences. But I'm like, just say it like how Paul's saying it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But I, f- yeah. I, feel, I feel like some people, given, because you, obviously you're, you come from an accountancy background, Paul, I feel that like, you, maybe people in that industry expect that and then that i think that's why you do so well is because if you you, you just say it how it is you know rather than okay. having that 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 scripted sort of you know 100 percent. but like i say if you did reel off now the leaders that you um that you actually really look up to there will be people who say it as it is that's relatable and try to simplify it not 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 kind of uh i don't know gain intellectual point scoring by overcomplicating to be, it yeah overcomplicated and clever so uh, you know that's why i was really let down last night i thought it was really uh, a letdown i was really annoyed because i'm holding on you know i'll have two thousand or a thousand or i'll have a lot of clients mm. ringing me just to say paul how do you think it's going and i'm not the expert on any of this i can only go off feed off what i'm being fed myself and make you know uh, you know, if it's legislative stuff, like how do I get my business through this? I can give them the legislative stuff. But you, we need to understand what this starts to look like on the other side of the storm. It's one thing, I think, to like going into this storm. And I, 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 I've just all the way through this, I've been using the, the analogy of going into a storm with a staff. And I'm like, we've got to bolt everything down. We've got to secure everything we've got. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. I think that's kind of the easy part to a degree. But what do you now look like on the outside? You know, because that's the life-changing part. We know this part is temporary. It might be 12 weeks. It might be eight weeks. It might be 16 weeks. But this part is temporary. On the outside, on the other side of the storm, though, when, when, when daylight breaks, what does it look like? Mm. And I feel like to keep the morale of the, the country up, um, we've got to be able – there's no point saying there's a five-point plan like they did last night and keep fucking going back to it. But not saying, if we tick this five-point plan, this is what happened, guys. Mm. Because that's like the oldest trick in the book. You have to dangle hope, light, you know, reward at the end of it. Say, you do this and you'll get that. Last night they just said, you do this. Oh, but Mm. what? You do this. Ah, but what about you? And I just felt like, for me this morning, I thought, I hope the phone doesn't keep going of my clients saying, what do you think now? You know, I've got travel industry clients. I've got bars that are fucking shut down and restaurants. They want at least an inkling of, ah, well, we might be going back to school. You know, the plan is, if we take these five principles, when we get there, the first thing we'll do is we'll open small businesses. Mm. And we'll be doing that, but we'll still be keeping a two-meter thingy. You might have to wear a mask. So don't expect to be drinking in pubs in the middle of May. Okay, fine. We know. And you've got to start to have a plan and you've got to have hope. That is the key Mm. thing in all this. Without hope, there's no way Winston Churchill would have got up last night and fucking delivered a spit. And here we go again. You know, they stood there. He stood there with his navy blue suit on and his red tie and he's repeating like a robot what he's been told to say. Yeah. To every question. It's the same answer. He should have just gone off at nine minutes past five because he just, 
stay home, save. We know we've got to stay home. We know we've got to help our NHS mm. and we know we've got to save lives. We know that. And then what? Do yeah. you know what I mean? But yeah. mate, what's so what's so frustrating, mate, is what you're saying is just so common sense. Forget even business and business leaders and people in that industry. Talking to the man on the street, I was walking my dog a few days ago now, I think it was the start of the week. And uh, you know, old fella like was, you know, standing on two meters apart and the old fella said, Oh, I just want to. I just want to know, kind of, you know, when I can start to. It's like just give me a bit of hope at the end of the tunnel. And this is a guy who's a pensioner walking his dog. He just kind of, and I know they can't give us a direct, that like a, a definitive answer, but at least give us that bit of hope of. And and this is a guy who's you know a pensioner walking his dog, and he was in the same boat. Yeah, hundred percent. So I felt like it was a real leadership. The match, like Jurgen Klopp going into a big game and going, <clears throat> kick the football, score a goal. With the game. <laughs> How points. do you want us to do it? Yeah. <laughs> Kick the football, score a goal, win the game. No, but it's the Champions League final or the fucking, we win the Premier League. Stay, kick the football. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've, got to, you've got to instill passion. <clears throat> Paul, didn't, yeah. you, didn't you go to, um, did Jurgen Klopp do a speech with Pep? Didn't you get, yeah. I see something on LinkedIn? Yeah. Amazing. Was it good? Amazing. Oh, it was amazing. So it was the... Yeah, uh, we spoke about that. You said I was, I was in ghost listening to you just relaying the messages that they got. That they said. It, it was phenomenal. I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm lucky. I'm, so obviously I'm from Manchester, but uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a Stockport County fan, so I don't quite have the rivalry of it. I've got more of a rivalry with Tranmere than I've got with Liverpool, but um, <laughs> it's not even that anymore. I don't even know who the rival is with. But um, yeah, it's um, it was... I, I've never really been in the presence of somebody I don't think that I'd always quite liked, you know, because you see him and how do you not like him? But I just didn't realise how much how much charisma he had. And he, and literally, I mean, you, you, you could just hang on every word, but he spoke mm. fun. It wasn't boring. It wasn't robotic. It wasn't monoton- monotonous. You could relate to it. He talked about his love for his... Uh, for his team, his backroom team was all there, and he spoke, and, and you could tell, you know, when some people go up and it, and it's, it is kind of a just saying it for, for the same sake. Mm. You just get the impression with him, he didn't know what he was going to say on the night, he just lets it come out, yeah. but it, and it's from the heart, and it's, and it's, and it's true, and it's, and it's good, and his love that he has for the backroom staff, and the honesty which, with, with which he spoke, um, phenomenal leadership phenomenal yeah. it's an amazing feeling isn't it when you're in a room with someone or and again i'm not I'm not saying this to, to uh, blow smoke up your ass but if you're in ever in a room or and you've got some leader of some sort and you're in that presence it is a feeling isn't it when you know someone's got that respect from the peers and uh, i have so when i go and do these corporate gigs sometimes you go through them and you, you can just know that maybe the people in the room don't respect the boss or they don't respect them and then you go in to do other gigs and you know Wow, he's he's clearly well respected. He knows what he's talking about. You just get a something in the air about it, isn't there? You just know you get this feeling about someone. Yeah, I think it does come down to you. you as you get as you get older with age, you know who's uh, who's telling the truth and who's just spinning out a line. And that's why I wasn't so happy last night. I thought, you know, if it was a war last night, and this is a, this is kind of like a war. If that was a war last night, you'd all put your fucking guns down, wouldn't you? And say, with you know, there was just nothing that got a yeah. fire in your belly to, to really sort of put you up. And maybe with, with, when Boris comes back, you know, maybe we'll get that back um, or maybe we'll get it. So I don't think the government have been massively bad in this situation, by the way. It's unprecedented mm. waters. So it's easy to just criticise, criticise, criticise. Uh, one of the things I've been quite impressed with is, and I, was, and, and, and I hope this continues, is the... Um, the togetherness, if that's the right word, of all political parties. Because mm. I've been completely, I haven't voted in the last two elections because I don't believe that blue and red or Labour or Tory, I don't believe any of them are worthy of a vote because I think they are um, uh, uh, point scoring to get votes more than they mm. are actually trying to do what's right by the, the normal person. Uh, as with any, any argument you have, usually the truth is somewhere in the middle. And what you've had is just so far left and so far right, and so fanatical blue and so fanatical red, that I think that has been the focus rather than actually what is it that people need. 
And I think if there has been, and I think there will be some positives come out of this. One of the positives I've seen was like Andy Burnham, who's a Labour, I think he's the, well, he's the mayor of Manchester, but he's Labour MP, I guess. Kind of saying that was really good what Boris has done here for businesses, but mm. I think it can improve that. You know, I think that that was a great speech by da da da, but I think they need to, they've missed the trick with here. And I think that's refreshing. And I hope with politics, we don't go back to what we just had for the last five years or more, which is just bashing one another like kids in a playground um, to get more votes. So if that comes out of it, you know, that'll be a huge campaign. <clears throat> Seeing that, mate, I've seen someone on Twitter, well, they began to do this. I think I just unfollowed them or something. It was someone said, oh, they, and I just thought, this is not the time to be point scoring. I mean, this wasn't anyone political. It was just someone, I don't know who it was, but I thought there's no point now. It's, you're not, no one's gaining any, anything from saying, oh, Labour would have done this or Labour. And the funny thing is, I've probably got to be careful what I say now, but I think Labour or Tory, Boris Johnson or Corbyn, whoever it may be, I think, there's only so much that they can... This is unprecedented times, do you know what I mean? And I think what's funny in Liverpool, which is a shame, I said this to Tom earlier, you know, Boris Johnson could come up with a cure tomorrow and, you know, a vaccine. He could make it himself in his house right now and people would still say he's done a shit job, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And that's the kind of way you want to get away from that political side. You want someone to just be judged on the leadership and how they've done and, you know, forget the, the this and that. And, and I hope you're right, mate, that we can come together and... And, and can just be more collectively together as one politically than, than rather than you say so much extremes in one way or the other. 100%. I think, it, you know, I, th I think that's a positive that'll come out with it. I don't know what you two guys think, but it has made us readdress slightly. You know, that somebody said to me this morning, it won't be the same again. And in a way you think, well, thank fuck for that. Because I felt like we were on, and I'm as guilty as anyone for this. I felt like I'm on such a, hamster wheel of trying to gain success whatever you whatever that is and finance and all these other things you do kind of forget what's actually uh why we're actually here and what what is actually meaningful mm. and even sometimes you know if you are trying to self improve you try and bring some meaningfulness back into your life but it comes and it goes and it flips and i put a status up the other day i was supposed to be a snoop dog on sunday <laughs> Pussycat dolls I wasn't too bothered about on Tuesday. I, I, I told the missus I'd go. And we were supposed to be going to the hotel we go to every year where they, uh, in, in Halkiriki where it's just mega. They look, they look after all the kids, so you get a bit of time. And yet, on the Wednesday, we were supposed to fly out. I went to, like, where I grew up from, and there was a little river there. And the kids, me and the two youngest lads, uh, five and three, they just threw stones in the river for, like, 40 minutes. And I thought, fuck, now you've got a dog, so that might be different for you. Because I think if you're a dog owner or an animal owner, you get access to things more yeah. often like that. But, you know, I've not, I fed the ducks with my youngest uh, the, a few of the week before. I'd never fed the ducks with him before. Do you know what I mean? It's, and um, so I've tried to get some uh, positivity out of that, but we'll see what happens when we come back in it. Because, you know, you, you just don't know whether we'll go back to normal after a week. I think yeah, it, I've kind of got, <clears throat> I've got two views on it. I've kind of, I think you know, positive changes will definitely happen, but it's kind of just how long will they last for, you know? And I think people will start off with maybe the good intentions, and people will continue to go go for runs and stuff like that. And will that last maybe six weeks after lockdown, six months, or well, I don't know. I actually put a post on today about about running because I've never seen as many people run. I mean all the time just people are running and it's, it's great that people are get, getting fit and I just hope that you know running or like you know yourself before you talk about well, you know working out and stuffing in the gym so important for your mental health and I hope that people continue to harness that positive energy for one you know looking after themselves physically and the things that can lead to you know mental well-being and, and everything like that and it'd be such a shame that everyone's picked up these great little you know YouTube workouts and going for jogs and then within a couple of weeks of doing back to nine till five day, everyone thinks, so. Oh, well, fuck it, I'll forget about all that. It, it, it'd be such a shame. Mm. Tell you what I've learned. If you want to get somebody to do something, tell them not to do it. You know, for 25 <laughs> years, for 25 <laughs> years, the government have been telling us to exercise, haven't they? And it's good for you. And there's fucking nobody out. <laughs> the minute they put you in lockdown, 
Yeah, it's, it's like what it's like fucking Central Park where I live now. <laughs> it's unbelievable, isn't it? So that's the way. If you want to get somebody to do something, tell them not to do it anymore. The one thing I'm, I said to you, Andy, over the phone before, the one thing I'm very surprised about is that um, what I thought is that there'd be more like looting, that sort of thing, you know, like, um, you know, more crime. And so you think the amount of premises that are empty and businesses that are empty and then you know, none of that's mm. gone on. Everyone's been pretty much, you know, adhering to the rules, you know, to some extent. I don't that's know how the truth is, but there was someone the other day, I agree with you, Tom, there was somebody on the news that said they'd not been like a knife crime for three weeks. I don't know how true that oh, is. No, they, hey, they've not been in Liverpool. Someone got bloody shot and stabbed last week in Liverpool. Did they? Bloody, yeah. Is it, Did like they? Two, two 18 year old, one of them. Someone got bloody shot one week, and then the next week there must have been a revenge attack or something, and someone got stabbed. It. So there's still a lot of craziness going on, unfortunately. Not as yeah. much, but. I do yeah. think as well, you know, everyone's, you know, saying about, you know, the amount of people who are using Zoom now and things like that and co university, co university courses going online. But to be honest, I just can't, I, there's, there's nothing beats, you know, it, look at us doing this podcast. I mean, you know, unfortunately we have to do it through Zoom, but Jesus, I can't wait to do it in person. Mm. So I don't, it's a, I can see from a business point of view that, you know, the, like, you know, what I do pull to be in Sadulu bar now, but you know, like the, 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 the amount of, you know, cost that could be saved, I suppose, from everyone working from home, but I'm just not a fan of it. I can't see it. I just can't see it happening. I don't know what your thoughts are. If you it's, made, it's made me just miss human interaction so much. Like just being in someone's company and smiling and laughing and, you know, yeah. It's mad. I was, um, the other day, I, I mean, I, the other day, it, we had a night. Well, no, we had a debate in our house over who was going to go and wash the fucking car. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because that's now become a treat. In the past, it'd be an, obviously it's an argument. I'm now I haven't got time to do this. The other day, I'm like, I think I'll go and wash, wash it, go and wash the car yeah. in the car wash. <laughs> He's like, no, no, I think I'll do it. It's all right. I'm like, you've never washed a car in your life. No, I'm going to take it through the... Uh, and then we're having a debate on who's going to actually just get half an hour away from the kids, basically, to go and do it. Yeah. So. It is, um, it is going to be interesting. And, and um, my next door neighbour, I know him reasonably well. And um, as I was going to the car, and that was the point, as I was going to the car, he was on the front skipping. And um, so I just chatted to him. And I thought, fuck me. I never took that time mm. to just chat to my neighbour. And last night, I've got a bit of a gym in my back garden at the moment. So I was working out and had some music on. And I could hear him singing my music through the... Uh, who on the other side of the fence and then I popped my head above what are you up to and I've never I bet he's lived here five years and I've never had a conversation over the fence with him not once and I remember in the middle of the conversation just thinking this is actually quite powerful mm. do you know what I mean it's weird how the little little things like that um, I think there will be less uh, personal interaction particularly businesses where we can drive some cost but we're also going to drive some carbon footprints down aren't we by mm. Yeah. By the use of Zoom and that kind of thing. So, you know, there is a little bit of a reset going on for people. I think people should use this as a reset, whether it's business, whether it's you as an individual. Um, you know, we, we're all sort of missing people that we might be closer to, but you just take for granted seeing them every now and well, then. mate, some, some of those things as well, they don't have to be huge things. You know, one stupid little thing that I've definitely learned and I used to spend a fortune every month eating out, just in my local little cafe, just like a local little cafe at the top of the road. Now, I mean, I ten of a day maybe, but most mornings I, I eat out, and I'm thinking I'm spending probably 60, 70 quid a week on on a bloody full English or a, a jacket, potato and tuna, and I'm like, every day I've just been having me eat a bit, sort of, you know, cooking whatever, and I'm thinking, why Why am I eating out every single or, or most days? It's... Yeah. I'd love Little to see the like beer that. garden now, though, would you? Oh, oh the oh, absolute yeah. scenes. Mate, <laughs> 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 one thing I was going to say, mate, because I, I know you do a lot of, and it's what I'm looking forward to getting involved in with Tadulo, is, um, is the community work that you've done. I mean, what impact do you think that that's going to have maybe on the next few weeks? And again, what you've described as you know, after the storm? Because I know you guys are obviously heavily involved in, in giving back anyway. Do you want, has that kind of had an impact on, on how you yeah. view and things like that? Yeah, I mean, 
I don't know if we discussed on the last podcast, but I'd got to a point where uh, numbers was just becoming, I was becoming more unhappy. The bigger we got, the more unhappy or unsatisfied I was getting. And um, so I, I had to kind of, I think I'd lost my purpose. My purpose at some point were to get a million pound business and then a two million and a five million. And then um, I, I just, it was getting less and less. And then I think after my podcast with Pete Cowgill, where five billion is not enough, I feel like, I'm, well, what's the fucking point in keep chasing this? Mm. If you get to five billion <laughs> as, and, and, that, and then you need six, you, you're on the wrong fucking road to yeah. happiness here, aren't you? If you think this is going to sort it. So I kind of changed my business anyway to be more focused on on the community um, so that, uh, and, and we have um, every week, we have that blackboard that I've been doing some bits of stuff on, uh, videos and that. We Everybody does a video every week to say, right, what has Sajulo done to the commu- in the communities this week? And it could be anything. Some people jump out of planes. Some people might have done some volunteering. Some Saju, uh, we might have... You know, it could be anything. It's just something different. But every week we have a commitment. And that then gives a purpose to the whole team, of course, then. Because if you're just driven as a leader of a business by you get into 10 million, what's in it for the, what's mm. in it for the, you know, the person in front of house or the admin uh, lady or the accountant in the team? And then the reality of it is, is nothing. So by repurposing the business, it gave everybody a purpose. So now everybody can, everybody can contribute every week to our overriding purpose of, doing good in the communities we're existing. Um, so anyway, so that's why we, 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 we I guess we're, we're around now. And, um, but then this came along and it was like, oh fuck, you know, you've got to look after yourself first. I think some people feel like they're being selfish when they say that. And I don't, I feel like you've got to get yourself in the best mental, physical, financial, emotional state you can. And then you're able to assist others. And I think that's true of an individual. And I think that's also true of businesses. There's no point saying, Sajulo saying, oh, we do all this in the community if we're going to go bust in three months because we, you know, we've lost yeah. our focus. So, so for about three weeks, we kind of shrank in and it was like, have we got the infrastructure to work? You know, have we got the culture? Have we, how are we going to do this? How are we operationally going to work? And after about two weeks, I thought, okay, we've got that now. We was on lockdown about two weeks before lockdown. So I thought, okay, we're all right. And then I was getting a bit edgy and I thought, I've got to go back to what our purpose is now. So we went back to being in the community. And um, so, and it's little things like every, every day, I think we said before, we have bars in our offices or they're like hotel lobbies, I guess, aren't they? People yeah, yeah. Them, you know, they're a bit like that, but there's a bar and we offer free food and free drinks. So we have a budget every week for that. So, so we just deployed that budget to, um, doing food parcels for the elderly or um wow. or, or kids at school because a lot of kids uh in in the poor areas you know that their their best nutritional nutritionalist food consumption is probably at school it's probably the, the paid school dinners mm. so you know they're on bags of crisp and shit now they're at home you know mm. what i mean so so we started to work with uh deploying our the uh, london uh, london manchester leeds office the food budgets now go out every week to they either go to the elderly or the ground. Mm. So we started to do that. And that was that you've seen an immediate lift in the morale of the team. Mm. You know, there was an immediate lift. And then um, we got approached by a school and then we normally do a lot of entertaining, you know, and you've been on a few of them, Andy, where, you know, mm. this month we would have spent, I don't know, 10 grand easy on entertaining, let's say. <laughs> all business. And um, so then we said, okay, if we're not going to do that, how can we deploy those funds or at least part of those? So we started, we got approached by a special school that is going to stay open, of course, because it's uh, their classed as key workers or whatever, and the kids need it. And the the, the sunny weather had come out. So we, we, we donated and paid for a load of outdoor play activities and so on for them. So we've started to use uh, some of the money we'd ordinarily use yeah. on activities we're now not doing just on operational um, and just deploy them within the community so that's created and then we said we we when they did the nhs volunteers we said we'd uh, everybody can not uh, put themselves forward and volunteer and we just carry on picking up the wage um and we wow. re- big so i think we've got nine nhs volunteers that, that, that are doing it and we just work around them accordingly so every week we put out to the staff you know it's it's kind of business as usual from a community perspective. Mm. 
And what I've noticed, and I notice this in general, but even more so now, the staff are really fucking proud of being part of. Yeah. You know, we got a picture last night from a woman I'd seen on Facebook saying, God, she'd ask, she'd put out there that she'd make parcels for her home and she'd have 40 requests. And, uh, you know, she's not of means to, to stomach that financially. So she put it out there. We sent her a check. And last night she sent, I think it was about 80 massive parcels out to elderly people. I sent that to the staff. You know, and they get a buzz that they're not just doing this for to pay their own mortgage and that, you know, there's a being, in, being part of society, but I feel like whether you're in coronavirus or not, business leaders should be doing more of that regardless. Mm. Mate, as someone who, I've never, I've never led a team in that sense, but someone who's had some really good leaders in the military, mate, I, I can't tell you how much that does when you have a boss who, who comes up with an idea or an, or an initiative, or even might not be the boss's idea, but someone in the team says, why don't we think about that? But then the boss then, implement that idea the, sat, the sense of satisfaction and actually what i'm doing actually matters it's probably one of the biggest things you can have from a team because there's nothing worse than if you're doing a job and you're thinking whether i do this job or not it doesn't fucking really matter in the grand scheme of things that's the worst feeling in the world that you're insignificant you're not you've not got a purpose whereas if you're you see like you say a photo of someone who's been able to give out 80 boxes of whatever it's like fucking hell that's that, that was us that we've done that mm. and it's that's the kind of warm, fuzzy feeling you've got to get when you're working in a team, especially when you're going through some sort of global pandemic like this. Yeah, 100%. So we focused a lot on that now because it's about, again, it is about the community, but it's also about the morale of the team. And like you say, you know, they want to play their part. They feel good. Mm. And uh, if people feel good about what they're doing, they'll do more of it. It's as simple as that. Isn't it? Mm. Paul, can I ask uh, just on a, I think this might help a few people. So, Obviously, you're, you know, as an accountant, um, and this might be quite a difficult question to answer because there's so many, um, so many variables. But for people who are still working, what, what, what? Well, everyone really. What would your advice be? Would it be to, as in, to manage finances now? Would it be to look just scale back on everything possible that you can, you know, crawl back into lockdown in inverted brackets financially and just like just just I mean, it's difficult to spend anyway, given there's no restaurants or anything, yeah. but w would that be the correct advice that you'd give to someone? Or is it so hard to say that? I know no, I mean, okay. yeah. The, yeah. I mean, the first thing, the first video I did um, when they came out with how they're going to help, the first thing they came out with was you can get a three month mortgage break. So I'm like, the first thing you've got to do is just do that. And, and that kind of happened like this, you know, it was quite well done that. And in the main, I've found that everybody who's gone for that within a week or two had got a three month mortgage break because you've got to keep that, get that bleed down. Then if you're a business owner, there's a number of things what the government have done. Um, so the first thing is, is you don't have to pay your VAT liab liability in, in, the Q in, March, in April, May and June this year, you pay it next year. So you just cancel your direct debit. But then you've got business rates they put on hold for April, uh, April, May and June. So cancel your direct debit. Then, then they've issued grants. So there's a £10,000 grant and a £25,000 grant that's issued from your local authority for businesses. You just go on the portal of your local, um, it's Liverpool Borough Council or Stockport Borough Council or Bolton or wherever it is. You go on, you put in your details I ask, and it tells you there. And then if you qualify for it, if you qualify for it, within a week, you'll get your ten or £25,000. Um, personal tax, if you're a, if you're a personal taxpayer, we normally have our um, mid-year payment to make in July. You just don't pay it. That You've got to pay it in January next year now instead. So they were all the first things like from a general housekeeping mm. that I was advising people to do immediately. Um, and then a bit further on from that, obviously, they've brought a few more things out where if you're self-employed, there's going to be some winners and some losers. But if you're self-employed, they're going to they're gonna write to you the HMRC in June and they're going to work out a calculation for March, April, and May, you know, a quarter of the year's salary from your last tax return, profits, they're going to pay you. So if you're self-employed and you're still able to work right now on a building site, construction site, which of course, in theory, you are, you're still working through March. You might be able to still work now by the looks of it through April and we start to open out at some point in May. In June, you're going to get effectively the same payment again. Mm. 
So from a self-employed perspective in June, I think there's 3 million people that are going to qualify. And not everybody will be able to be self-employed and still working like you, Andy. You've obviously, you, mm. you're not doing your motivational speaking, but from your last tax return that you filed for uh, April 19, that you filed by the end of January this year, they're going to pay you for April, uh, March, April and mm. May, whether or not you've worked or not. Mm. So that's going to boost the economy on the whole, I think. If you've, if you've um, cut your mortgage, which is usually one of our biggest expenditures, mm. and you can't go out on the piss, let's be honest, um, you can't be going buying bottles of uh, vodka in, in VIP booths, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um those gray gooses can't be exactly. uh, <laughs> gray goose kind of guy um, <laughs> him and his 20 mates all chipping in for the for the one <laughs> <laughs> you know me too well <laughs> um, but if so you can't spend your money that way so i think if you're a, if you if you're <clears throat> and you're um, and you sat home and you've got your mortgage break you, you could well be um more flush than what what you ordinarily would be Mm. Um, which is why all the online businesses are still doing well because everybody sat at home with disposable income with nothing to do with it. So there are a lot of winners out of this from uh, e-commerce brands. Um, so so and then it, well, sorry, sorry, but how, how do you think, obviously we're going to have to pay all this back, aren't we? And yeah, are you, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think the thing is, this is, um, what the government have announced in the main is other than the grants, which is either a rates grant or if you furlough employees. So if you're an employer, you're allowed, uh, I'm allowed to discuss with you. I'm going to furlough you. By the way, Tom, you can say no. So you have to accept it if I, if I want to furlough you. If you accept it, then I can put in a claim of up to 80% of your salary, uh, up to a value of two and a half grand a month. So, and that grant start coming through next week. That's what I was just discussing earlier. Um, they're really the only money that's being given away. The rest of it is all borrowing. Right. So, you don't have to pay. So if you look at me, you know, I don't have to pay my VAT this quarter, but I've got to pay it by the end of the year. I don't have to pay my tax return in July, but I've got to pay it by the end of January. Um, what else? Have I, uh, I don't have to pay my rates April, May and June, but I've got to pay it from July to um, April. If I get a coronavirus business loan, I'm going to pay it back. So in a way, what the government have done is they've borrowed us everybody money to get through the crisis. But I wouldn't say they've given lots of money away. Now, they've given money away in terms of these self-employed and employed grants. But the relative of it is, what would they be paying anyway? They'd be paying universal credit. They'd be paying, you know, what, what was the old dole money? I don't know what I think, well, it is, universal credit now, isn't it? Um, so there's an element of where there's offset that. They've offset that so anyway. Call on, <clears throat> call on the 80% furlough. If that then companies have to pay that back. No, so that part they don't. Right. But like I say, really, as a society, we're offsetting that against the universal credit and dole we'd ordinarily pay, isn't okay. it? And it's right. still gross, that. So they still pay you two and a half grand a month, but take the tax out of it. So they're still mm -hmm. getting the tax element of that two and a half. So it's not costing them two and a half grand a month. Um, mm. So I think... See, this is all things already that I just didn't even fucking think of or realise, you know. So I think they've been really clever, actually, with what they've done. Uh, it's all debt. And I think what, the, what, the, what, the, what they're hoping for is that it's an elastic band, is that there's a contraction of the economy and they think it's going to be the biggest a, a contraction of the economy to June in history. But I think they think, or the banking on July, August, September is going to be the biggest contraction of the economy in history. And as a result, the six, seven, eight month level playing field might level out and we can all pay our debt facts towards you know the beginning of next year the end of this year and so on so i think that's quite a sensible thing to do really if i'm honest with you mm. um and i think the only issue we're gonna have and this is what i think is gonna happen i'm not an economist but what i think is gonna happen is there's a lot of money out there at the moment and it will slowly it's not going out as fast as it should but it will get to the people hopefully that they need it sooner rather than later and then all businesses will be liquidized because at the moment in the recession, all the banks had no money. Right now, the banks are capitalised with loads of money. So, so long we can get them to put it out, all the businesses have got the money, which then for means, actually, for the next one or two years, we could really boom. Everybody's going to be, restaurant tables are going to be full, you know, uh, holidays, everybody. I mean, I have invested in a travel agent and they're selling holidays like nobody's business for 2021. Hello. 
Really? People just need a holiday, you know. So if, if you can't go Mallorca this year, um, people are just going to Florida next year and spending two years' budget on that. So, oh, yeah. So people, I think we're going to boom, if I'm honest with you. I think we're going to rebound with a huge boom. Um, subject to us getting out May and June, if it goes on longer than that, which I don't think it will from other European things, I think we will, it, we will elastic band back as an economy. And then it will boom and boom. But think about this. The reason we had the recession in 2008 was because of mislending, lending to people who shouldn't have been borrowed the money. Now what we're doing is we, as a taxpayer, a personally guaranteeing because what they say is the government's guaranteeing all these loans the government's not fucking guaranteeing the loans the taxpayer is guaranteeing the loans so if those loans go to people companies that ordinarily wouldn't have got one but can now use one in two three years a bad company now is likely to be a bad company then and so i think what we will see in two or three years is something similar to what we've seen in 28, 2008, which is a lot of companies continually being bad um, mm. and then going bust. And then I think we will hit a recession, which I'll be honest with you, would you anyway in 2023? Yes. Mm. Would you recession every 15 years? So that's, that's just so, so, so surprising though you think though, because what you'd read, I don't know if you still, obviously you still listen to the news, but I've, I've tried to block out what, what what i tend to listen to anyway more recently than than ever but it's so so su surprising that you think that, that it's just going to rebound because I'm, I'm, you, you you just expect that out of this M may june it's just going to be this hell hole of no one's got any money you know mm -hmm. but you look at i, I do think market. i do agree with you as well paul yeah i think we, we i obviously have a wealth management side where we invest funds under management uh for people and the stock market the, the people who are long in the tooth who've been through the bubble, the web, the web, um, the internet bust in the like 2000s or night, late 90s, the 2008, then you had 9-11, which was very much uh, elasticated um, and rebound. So all the people that are new to investing money on the stock market are like, I need my money back. I want my money back. I want my money back. All the people that have, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s who've been through this throughout the 70s, the 80s, the 90s and the 2000s, they're all going in. Um, they're all going into the stock market because they do expect um, it to come back. Uh, the Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan's all them. You'd expect them to sell. It's going to bounce back as well. Don't get me wrong because they want to keep the markets fluid. But I do think that the, ex the reason why there was a recession that lasted years with the banks was with, there was no money um, in, in the banks. Now the, the banking system is full of money at the moment. What were you, do what were you doing in 2008, Paul? Um wondering where it all went wrong <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd, I'd had some quite decent successes in 2006 2007 and i was only 20 odd late 20s and i just thought oh that's me forever i'm just going to keep making sucks just going to keep having more success um and i didn't realize that every 15 years you had a recession and it re recalibrated everything and that that's happened since 1944 um but i didn't know that at the time so i just thought i was a fucking legend of i've just thought everything i touched turned to gold i thought i was just going to keep i thought i'd have 80 businesses by now worth millions because the first two that i was working on 2006 2007 went really really successful uh, and then 2008 came and taught me a huge lesson what was that lesson don't get greedy oh, well I, I i think i wrote this in the book I, uh, so uh, obviously in the book that i wrote a guy came to me this guy was probably worth, no, his business turns over about 500 million and he was about 60 odd, this guy. And he came up to me and he said, oh, I've heard you've done really well in this particular business. And it was an internet marketing business um, that I was helping uh, one of my clients run and it became successful. But at the time we were making loads of money and um, this guy came up to me, I Paul, da 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 let me give you one tip, he said. Always put wool on your back for a rainy day. And I remember I've had a few beers. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I know who you are. I know what your business is. I'm not going to say who it is, but quite a well-known business. And I said, and I remember thinking in my head, you don't know what you're on about. I remember thinking, I'm 28. You know, <laughs> this business is making X amount of money. It's worth tens of millions. Um, I, didn't, I didn't particularly own it, but I was, I, was, I was receiving the benefits of its success, let's say. And um, 
Yeah, and, and I remember thinking, oh, he, this is an old guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't understand what the internet's about. You know, this is going to last forever. And I'm only 28. And uh, literally within a year, everything came crashing down. You know, particularly that was into a marketing agency, a digital agency. So, I mean, everybody just pulled their funds. So we went from making 200 grand a month profit to losing 200 grand a month within about a month. Jesus. And I remember thinking, fucking hell. And I've learned that lesson ever since so when we went into this one i was able to say to the staff listen guys don't worry about your jobs i don't know what this looks like but i know that we're a solid ship going into the storm and into the eye of the storm i don't know how bad it is but we was prepared as ever we possibly could be we're financially robust we've got wool on our back and so on and so forth so that was the lesson i learned um way back sort of 10 11 12 years ago that i guess has stood me in good stead for this one when you say wool on your back do you mean as in like hoard not hoarding cash but as in having that financial reserve yeah yeah so i never hoard cash i'm always telling my clients there's a certain amount of cash that if it's excess cash spend it on development innovation growth whatever it is Um, but there's got to be a certain amount of risk that you that you're willing to put your head on the pillow at night and go i'm actually can sleep fairly comfortably with this level of um Mm. with this level of comfort blanket of financially and um we 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 went into the storm with that this time whereas we went into the recession without it last time mate you bloody say get the keys for number 10 mate fucking get down there (laughs) another one well you've got to learn lessons haven't you I, uh, I, I, I mean, I just gained so much just from little, little snippets like that. You know, I just think, never mind the business, but my own personal kind of life. I just, you know, things like that. It's things that you don't, you don't learn in school, isn't it? Or no one actually tells you. You've kind of got to go and seek. Like we've seeked out to get this podcast and this friendships developed. You've got to kind of. That's when these little snippets of information and wisdom come to you, really, isn't it? You see, the thing is, is life's very short, but when you break it down into these um, 15 year curves, if you like, it's even shorter. Uh, Because if you take, so I'm 41 now, 42 in June. Um, I was about 26, 27 when we was having the last success, the last peak, 26, 27, 28. Um, And then, of course, after that, you get like three or four years of, of boom, maybe three years, and then it crashes for like what two or three years and then it stabilizes for years so we've been stable now haven't we what since probably from about 2012 i guess up to about 2016 17 then it started to pick up again there's more success stories it's more buoyancy so if you think about being a 20 odd year old you're gonna have one of those bells in your 20s and early 30s so there's one then you're gonna get the next one say from 30 mid 30s to late 40s there's two and then you've probably got one more and you retire now so you've only got three peaks in your life fight from financially if you look at it like that and the first one you don't you're not going to really know are you so the no. first one you've got to learn your fucking lessons on which is what i thought when i when i seen this trend and if you follow the housing property market trend you just see how the curve goes of, of economics mm. If you follow the average house and it, it, it can't, it, you see exactly what I've just described. And that effectively is just a, a mirror of, uh, the, of the economy. And uh, when I seen I'd lost out after the first one, I thought, fucking hell, I only got two left. And one of them is when I'm now, the other one's when I'm late 50, 60. So do I want to be doing what I'm doing now in that one? Do I, no, I don't. So that meant to me that in this one, this was the most important one in my life, the most important 15 years. So I have to make hey now while I've got the energy, the, mm. the, the motivation, the vibrancy. Because if you don't, you, there's very few businesses book the trend of the economy. You might have a Facebook during a recession or a Google. But, you know, for every one of them, there's 10,000 businesses that were good that are just plodding along waiting for the next, the next boom. So very few businesses book the trend. Of, of the general economy and general society. So you've only really got one in your life. So you have to really uh, make hay while that happens. But this one's horrible because this one's had a Brexit and, and, a, and a coronavirus. And, and we've had, is it four in five years or three general elections in five years? So this one's my one. 
Right. Tom, are you, how old are you? 27. Ah, you see. You're fucking learning on the first one. You're gonna have, when you go into the next one, you're gonna be laughing. But wait, to be I, fair, to be fair, mate, I got, I uh, I lost my paper round in two thousand and eight. But if you know, you've got to when you pin it down. I've got this one really, and this one's a f- economic and political uproar, Brexit, and now coronavirus. So I'm like, just give me two or three years to to get my. Uh, Get my nest egg sorted, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's where I'm at. But I learned from the first one, going back to the last one, you've got to go into it with some wool on your back because you, as good as you are, as brilliant as your product is, as brilliant as some of your businesses are, um, if they've not got that ability, it won't book the trend of a, of a recession in the main. So you've got to go into the storm with, you know, in, in the best nick you can. Mm. I suppose you're, you're in quite a good position in the fact that because you've got so many clients in different industries, you've got such like a good fa- like financial barometer of what is going on in the economy. You've got restaurants, you've got your bars, clothing company, that sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? It's it's a good, you can judge the economy quite well, I believe, I think. I feel dead lucky um, to be in that position, if I'm honest with you. And a lot of people, I've always felt like now and then somebody said, oh, you, would you fancy doing this BBC News programme? But I'm really shit at like, I don't follow the news if I can help it, because if you're following the news right now, it'll be bad for my mental health, number one. I mean, I was in tears the other day when, you know, my missus is pregnant and um, I read about, uh, I seen that nurse who's 28 who, who died and then they gave yeah, right, I'm in yeah. tears. I'm in fucking tears. Half seven in the morning. So I watched that and I thought, I've got to turn the news off for the rest of the day because otherwise it will seriously, uh, it will seriously bring my, my 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 uh, stability it would, de- it would depress me to be honest um so i don't follow the news because i find a lot of it's bad and negative and i don't like negativity in my life if i can help it and I'm, I'm not very good at following not very good at following statistics so i couldn't go on the bbc and say you know i know the stock market's down 20 percent, but i wouldn't i wouldn't really know probably five and a half thousand points to FTSE today and it was at seven and I think it's high at 7.9 but I w- I'm not I wouldn't I wouldn't put my house on them facts I just tend to go off what I see in real life more than what 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 somebody tells me do you know mm. what I mean so I'd go off I'd probably be decent at that but I'd hate to go on the beat I'd hate to go on Piers Morgan on a morning where somebody's debating because they'd be reeling off all these you know, literature facts that I wouldn't have a clue about. I just go off what I see in real life. Hey, what's going, mate? mate, there is a role for you, though. There's a guy I follow. I'm probably going to follow this podcast. I'll put a tweet about you because there's a guy I follow. Um, I think you follow him as well, Tom, the professor. Uh, uh, and he's like a Carol, um, He only joined uh, Twitter about a month ago, didn't he, or something? He's basically just joined to give everyone the lowdown about Corona is all about. And... Oh my God, he's brilliant. He is absolutely amazing. I've just given you things that, you know, again, a little bit in layman's terms, just telling it as it is. And I definitely think there's a kind of, uh, there's room for you, Paul, to give us all hope in that, not even just a business view, but just a whole kind of, on a personal level as well. I think uh, yeah. you need to be the, you need to be the voice of Twitter on that. He's brilliant, that guy. This Ca- guy, Professor yeah. Carol, what's he saying? After him, yeah, yeah. yeah. I follow him. So when it first came out, I was looking at going online and the Financial Times are doing graphs. And they started to do the graphs and it really shown that we were really behind Italy in the curve um, and others. And so I was starting to look at it going, when I'm looking at how I think the shape of this graph is going to go, I don't think we're going to be as bad as Spain. I don't think we're going to be as bad as Italy on the graph. And I was following other other. There's a worldometer out there that gives you stats. There's the FT coronavirus stats, and there was another one. And I was following them every day. And they were going, the UK is going to be worse than Italy. And I'm thinking, stats don't show that, what I'm following. And then what happened was, every day we was under the curve, under the curve of Italy, and then bang, the FT just came out with a completely different way of showing the stats. And now we've got closer to Italy. And I was like, Oh, fuck, maybe we are going to, you know, follow Italy's footsteps, um, which, let's be honest, was about almost what seemed to be like nearly a thousand deaths a day for about 15, 20 days. Mm. Touch wood, we don't seem to have hit that. 
And when you look at the amount of beds, I don't think we've ever gone over 100% where the news was full of Italy. It was always, you know, mm. they just didn't have enough IC, uh, IC units. Whereas we've not got to our capacity. And if you looked at the stats yesterday, they've really come down, particularly in London. The stats have come right down. So I guess, touch wood, we get free where we've never hit. Where so you've gotten in and said, oh, you're 40 odd, you can get it, but you're going to have to get it instead of Harold, who's 60 odd. It doesn't appear we ever got as bad a state as that. And it was showing this, the stats. And then the next thing, they changed it again. And we was over and worse in Italy. And I was like, fuck. And then, so then I just stopped following the stats, if I'm honest with you, because I felt like people were manipulating the stats. Yeah. As terrible as they are, I'm not saying the stats aren't terrible. You have to caveat everything you say about coronavirus with that because you don't want somebody to hear someone who's been upset and had uh, the life changed because of it. So I fully uh, respect all that. But we've got a right to be told the stats so we can, you know, we can <clears throat> adjust, our, adjust our mindset even accordingly. And not only that, mate, but you said something earlier about what's the point in saying stuff is if there's no hope. And the one thing that that guy does really well on Twitter is, is he will tell you what it is and he'll finish it off with something like, there's hope for the future, you know, things are working, things are getting better. And it's like, thank you, that's the hope that I was, I was seeking, you know. Yeah. That's one it's, thing he does really well. You know, what the politicians got to understand of, mate, they're dealing with humanity, they're dealing with humans. The first thing that when something's really bad, what you want is to somebody say it's going to be okay. Mm. That's all you want to fucking hear. You just want to hear it's going to be okay. And um, I feel he does that brilliantly. So he's the person I look out for now on the, on the yeah, Twitter. Same. He seems to be giving more of a normalised. I mean, he spoke today, I think, this morning, and said 500 people a day die from cancer. Yeah, uh, he, did, he, tweeted, yeah. he tweeted out, yeah, it's this he morning, yeah. You know, we need, we need to, you need to tell us the daily deaths on cancer. And that's not to say that with this virus, we shouldn't be getting the stats and we shouldn't be getting the data that we're getting. Uh, because, of course... The reality of it is, is, I believe when we come out of this, um, it's going to be a, a, around for a long time, but just the same as heart attacks, strokes, mm. cancers, influenza. You know, what I really like, my dad's 75 with asbestosis. When am, when's he going to? I can't see him leaving his front door this year. Mm. Until there's a vaccine, he can't leave his front door. That's the way, the way I see it. And I, I don't know whether part of putting an exit strategy together is that's worrying them. Is they're going to actually have to say that at some point? You know, mm. you're in, you're in until there's a vaccine because if my dad gets it, I would have thought he, he won't recover. So it's interesting. You know, I look at Sweden. They do quite a lot of work in, in, in uh, over there, and they've never gone on lockdown. And have you seen their graph? Oh, mate, be yeah. careful about this, mate. Oh. <laughs> Well, I've tweeted a few things on it, and um, or put on the Instagram story a few things, and anything I say, Corona, kind of, I just got. I don't get me wrong; it's been like fifty-fifty. Loads of people have been like, "Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, I agree." And then I've just had a barrage of, "You're talking shy. Fucking be quiet." And I, um, I initially, I made, um, I made a point and about, about the, I was basically trying to make the point, but I, I didn't say it correct at all about death numbers. It's quite funny, actually. I made the point of talking about um, it was when Italy was really bad, and I made the point of looking at Italy's graphs of annual deaths, and more people died. Of, I think it was something like I think Italy's death rate was at about seven thousand, and I think like twenty five thousand people die of Alzheimer's and dementia every year. And I said, "Isn't it interesting? I want not no one's talking about that." And I said it in such a wrong way that. People were like, yeah, but you can't catch dementia. I was kind of like, yeah, I understand that. But I was trying to make the, the argument that we were talking about then about the cancer death things. So yeah. um, I then put something up about Sweden because there was an article about they've not been on lockdown, but they have still got social distancing going on and there's no yeah. more than 50 people in it. And um, I just put that article up and it's a really interesting um, article here. And then people were just like, Sweden has a more densely populated area. There's this, there's that, there's and um, I just got completely battered out the water with it. So I'm very conscious on that of what you say. It's emotive, <laughs> isn't it? It's so emotive yeah. uh, for people. But it's interesting because what I have seen over the last two days is how the media are now starting to talk about. So they've, they've moved from, at one point, the deaths was, because I was following the stats to see where we were leading. And, and it was like, 
this amount have died here, this amount have died there, this amount have died here. Have you tried to get that information now? It's fucking hard work. To find out how many deaths there were in different places it is, is becoming hard work. As in specific within, like, cities and that sort of thing, yeah. No, like Italy, Spain. Ah, right, I'm with you, sorry. It's very, very difficult. I try to follow it every day just to see what the, what the trends are on, the, on Google in the main. And it's becoming more difficult to find out what the statistics are. And at the same time now, the media agenda is probably getting us ready to re getting us used to the fact we're always going to have it because now they're starting to move more towards the economy, unemployment, and they're starting to get mm. us they're starting to get us <clears throat> mad up, mad now, ready to go. We've got to go back to work. We've got to. So I can already see how the media mm. have really switched from, you know, uh, real sort of heart wrenching content to unemployment and 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 you know there there are studies out there that letting society go too far regressed in terms of economically will lead to far more casualties of the coronavirus than just those of the coronavirus i.e suicides depression mm. that lead into cancers and all the rest of it so it's a very very tough balance in it to uh so in and again i got into a i wouldn't say arguments but um there's just so many different ways of looking at it. And my surgeon, um, he's just from a very military point of view, you know what I mean? He's had to make those ho awful, horrible decisions that people uh, were making in Italy, the doctors, about who deserves to go on a ventilator or not. I'm guessing he's been in similar similar situations. And, and he said something to me. And again, might be all wrongly, this is just how the military works. And he said, the big problem is with the NHS and civilians, if you like, if they, they're not in the military and they don't have that military mindset. Thankfully, they don't, they don't have to make these decisions. But the example he gave to me was he said, you know, if there's a, a soldier who gets blown up in Afghanistan and the hospital is left with just 10 pints of blood and this soldier needs 10 pints of blood, then obviously he would get that. But just as he was getting to the hospital doors to get operated on, there was uh, another explosion and five soldiers were injured and they all needed two pints of blood each. Then, then then the decision would be made to not give this soldier 10 pints of blood, even though he was there first, even though he needs it right now, the decision would be made to let him die and the blood would go to the five other soldiers who were coming in and, and save all of them. And that's how the military works. Now, to say that in, in civilian life, to say, look, I know, you, I know old Joey is 101 and he's got lung cancer and he needs to go on a ventilator. We, we know in... Tomorrow we're going to get a 40-year-old guy on who's, you know, a little bit overweight, but he needs it. You can't turn around to a family and say, look, I you know, know, your granddad's not going on it. And, and that's the tough thing about civilians and military. And I probably naively and stupidly tried to put my military thinking on. And, yeah. and I hope I didn't offend anyone, but I was kind of saying the point of the economic damage, what we just said then, the suicide, the homeless. And I kind of said, you know, you try saying to someone, you're not allowed to work or you're going to have this economic damage and a guy loses his house and his wife and kids end up being on the street. You know, you try saying that to someone who's got a 99 year old granddad and he wants them on a ventilator and it's such a hard way to kind yeah. of what's more important, you know, and it's such a, and, and that's why I, f I feel a little bit like the, when people are kind of going on the offensive saying one political party is doing right or wrong, it's, it's not the time. It's a hard decision to make, whoever you are and it's, it's got to be so lightly tread because you can offend people like I, I think did initially. Yeah. And it was maybe me, I was just trying to look at it from that military point of view where maybe now is the time to be a bit, to be a bit more empathetic towards the kind of, I, I don't even know how to. There was a story in London and you, again, you've got to be careful with what content, um, how, how much you believe content nowadays, don't you? But there was a story and I think it was only last week where there was a, but it, and it was on social about an 81-year-old woman who'd refused the ICU. I don't know if you read that. And she just said, look, I'm 81. There'll be somebody else behind. I've lived my life. There's somebody behind me. And you just, yeah. this heartwarming stories like that, isn't there, you know, of uh, yeah. uh, what, what people have done. I think in the main, you know, um, I was quite disappointed at first when, when the people were like panic buying. Uh, I, I went to the, oh, yeah. I've not panic bought everything. Anything should I say? And I went to the um, local shop, and there was a guy behind me. And I walked in the shop. There was fuck all in it. And there was a guy behind me, and he must have been—I would say—he's got to be eight, eight, late eighties minimum. 
and um, he just tipped his cap, he tipped his hat off, and he just looked around at an empty shelf, and I thought, what the fuck is going on? You know, the guy can't get, he's probably fucking, took, I don't know how many yards he'd walk, but if he'd walk a thousand yards, it's probably took him an hour, do you know what I mean? And he's got up there and there's nothing. And um, my, I had a bit of a fear at that point, if I'm honest, of how uh, we as a society were going to deal with this. Because mm. uh, I felt like the first test we had, we failed. We failed Absolutely, miserably. Yeah. Fucking, mm. You know, we, we, we stopped piling toilet rolls and, 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 and bread and all this kind of stuff that, that we didn't need to and depriving the people that um, that rely on 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 that one visit a, a week or whatever to mm. get it. Uh, so I felt like as a society in the UK, we we failed out the first hurdle. But I do think since then, there has been um, a lot of heartwarming, you know, compassionate stories of how people are helping. And uh, and and if one thing comes out of this again, perhaps it's going to be a reset um, of how we behave to one another moving mm-hmm. forward and who we do you know it's, it's easy to say football is this and 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 the nhs is you know and in the situation we're in but how will it be on the other side you know what i mean mm. footballers don't do anything wrong and they're being attacked unfairly you know they're just normal lads usually who give a lot yeah. back you look at like what rashford and uh people i mean he's yeah. what he's doing in manchester is phenomenal um yeah. so most of the time these people have got hearts the same size as as anyone else, do you know what I mean? Um, but I do, th- I've always said before, I think there's sometimes there's such an over-reliance on, like football. I see some of my mates who are like, whether the United or Man City fans, and they almost live the week for that game of football on a Saturday. Mm. I think, fucking hell, you're 30-odd, 40. I get it when you're 15, but when you're 40, there's got to be more to life than whether somebody else who you don't know wins a game. And I feel like what's happening at the moment is, and I was going to ask you this question before, Andy. I honestly think, somebody said to me the other day, oh, somebody's interested, United are interested in Harry Kane and I don't give a toss. And I thought, well, that's interesting because that would have made your whole fucking year, six months ago. By the way, why is beyond me? I understand we like our clubs and and maybe I'm just part of one that never wins anything as a Stockport fan, so it's a bit different might not experience the highs that a United fan or whatever might be. But I do think there's like this over-reliance on things like that. And people might just go back to being uh, looking after their families, looking after themselves and looking after, you know, the people over the road now who can, you know, there is a lot more of that coming back into society. Yeah, I want a hundred percent. I uh, absolutely agree with you and hundred percent absolutely disagree with you as well because <laughs> I've, I've thought that I've thought the same. Hey, well on that point, I hundred percent hope that you're right and we can start putting more energy and focus into our neighbours and you know, doing the good deeds that, that are happening now. And I'm I'm the same, mate. I am um, I have looked back and I've thought I relied so much on those eleven players kicking a ball about every Saturday on my happiness. And I did, you know, and I've I thought it's quite sad. That I'm I'm focused so much on this, and it did it did kind of give me a bit of a wake up call. At the same time, though, it made me think that I do love it. Though that is a passion of mine, and I do yeah. really really enjoy it. And it's not it's not even so much the actual football. If I'm being completely honest, it's the meeting up with your mates and that social interaction and being part of that community and that family. And I guess that's come from Liverpool doing really well the last couple of years. You know they they've been on an unbelievable roll under Klopp, and so. I want to sit on the fence, yeah, part of me was thinking, God, I am quite sad, you know, why I'm so obsessed over these people. But then another part is, I just want to be back with all my mates again, just enjoying this little hobby that we've all got. Tom, but, what yeah, are you but... looking forward to doing? I'm looking forward to getting the uh, chipping in for the Grey Goose, move me and Andy. <laughs> 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 now, I'll tell, tell you one thing, just, just uh, sort of sideswiping your question, Paul. One thing um, which I was just about to mention was, what I've noticed is, obviously, before all this, there was a lot of talk about a, a, universal, in, a universal income of, obviously, a huge amount of machines are going to be taking away people's jobs and that sort of thing. And there's yeah. a potential talk of people literally being given a living by the government. I suppose it's communism in a way, isn't it? But how the, the one thing that stemmed from me is, Eve, I've got friends who, luckily, I'm still working, but I've got friends who are, who are furloughed. And 
all right, given the circumstances, you can't go to restaurants and things like that, but they're trying to find work as in voluntary work, anything to keep your mind stimulated. So, you know, that thing of being retired and having a load of cash and, you know, not really doing much is just, just does not appeal to me anymore one bit. Mm. Um, so, but to answer your question, um, I'm just looking forward to going to a restaurant, mate. I'm really looking forward to going to a restaurant. I'm looking forward to football starting back up again. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing friends. Just, just the normality of, uh, yeah, I tell you what, one thing I'm really looking forward to is, <laughs> is actually shaking someone's hand because mm. <laughs> it feels so weird. Like the ability of going like to a meeting or anything and not shaking someone's hand, you know, I haven't done it in weeks. It's just that, like, that thing we joke about there though, the, uh, like the great goose in the club and stuff like that. Not that I've ever done that. But um, <laughs> me and all my mates were, were, were talking and laughing. We don't, we're not even going to go to town to a, to a nightclub. I just want to stand in my local old man's pub on a Sunday afternoon and just, you know, have that little circle, that little ring of steel where you're all just there, just talking. None of these, you know, really loud nightclubs and like that. Just the sitting around, standing around in a pub in our local, just talking shit. That's, yeah, not interested in anything else. Just that would be nice. Yeah. Going to be interesting to see, isn't it, when it goes back to on the, other, on the way out. Yeah. yeah, we could uh, we could get you back on and uh, once all this is over, Paul. And yeah, uh, let's see let's see if I was right or wrong. Hopefully, on on a lot of it, I'm, it's going to be right because I still feel quite positive and upbeat. I'd like to think we come out of it sooner rather than later. Um, there's going to be casualties because there already is plenty of them, but you know, hopefully, we just come out of this sooner rather than later. In it, simple yeah. as that. Now. I'm mate again. I'm, I, I can't thank you enough, mate, for um, just for your own uh, your friendship, mate, and and your backing throughout this time, mate, as well. Because I know um, I know you've you've shown great kind of trust in me, mate, of keeping our uh, working relationship going through this time, mate. And that meant a lot to me. So I appreciate it again, mate. No worries at all. No worries, and thanks for having me on again. I've enjoyed yeah, yeah. it, Paul. When you uh, I know all this is kit, but when are you opening your Liverpool office. Um, well, it should have been 31st. So we're acquiring a business over there. Um, so we should have been open 31st of March. Um, we've put it back now probably to June. So mm. I would say any time between, depends on this now, but any time between June and September. And that, and that is one of the things I'm gutted about, to be honest, because I've been spending like every, I get try and get right into the cities when I go into them. So I've been going there every Friday just, going to different places for breakfast, for dinner. I like to get a buzz of what's going on. I've been visiting. I went to see the, um, I looked at office. trying to get him into the gym though, Tommy. He hasn't fucking quite managed. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's on, the, it's, on me, uh, it's on me radar, that Andy. I'm coming down there. Don't you? <laughs> but um, what, I, what I was going to say, I went to the liver buildings because we had a look at uh, an office space in there. What they've done there is phenomenal. Yeah. looks fantastic when you walk in there. So I, when you start to look at the office space and I start to go, you really start to get a buzz for the city. And I can't wait to do it, to be honest. I was the same when it was Leeds. I don't understand these. I, I don't understand these people that are like fucking hate Manx or I hate Scousers or I hate no. Young. It just, I don't get it. And perhaps it is a football. I think it's got to be driven from football. And, and because I'm not one of the uh, supporters of one of the big clubs, it doesn't buy, but I just don't buy into it like, I think Manchester is a phenomenal city. I think uh, yeah. Leeds in, in a different way is phenomenal. And I think Liverpool is phenomenal. And I think, actually, they're all very, very different, but they're all very, very similar. And I kind of love that work ethic. I love that grit of, of trying to be successful, trying to do the best. I love the community spirit that's in all them cities. Uh, we're in London as well, but it's a different, you know... You, London's just different. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I always wanted to do Liverpool, even though loads of people, by the way, have said to me, you, should, you, you know, with, with your accent, Paul, you're, uh, <laughs> you might not do so well, but we'll see. I think... Uh, have, you, have you got an office? Have you picked an office, Paul? So uh, I've got to be careful here because um, we're buying somebody right. and they're based around the... They're not far from the town hall is what I'm going to say. Yeah, so yeah, they're fair. not far from the town hall and we will probably stay in that same office. Although we've looked around the liver buildings, we've looked around, what's that square called Andy at the back of the town hall? Um, ex exchange flags. Yeah, it will be exchange flags. So, you know, the Castle Street exchange flags, liver building, yeah. that's the area we're going to be in. Um, and yeah, I, I, I can't wait to be honest with you, but it's probably going to be now 
June, July, August, something like that. Bro. That'll be awesome, mate. Well, thanks again for giving everyone a bit of uh, positivity, mate, as well. I know I've certainly uh, feel a bit better as well, so uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank, no, you, thank you, Paul. I know it's been nearly two hours of your time on a busy day, but yeah, appreciate it, mate. Yeah, thanks so much. Take care, lads. See you later. Cheers, mate. See you in a bit. See you, See you now. See you later.